it helps if you remember to record. Um, what's this? How do I do this in Zoom? Hello, I'm the JMO and welcome to another episode of Come Internet With Me, the web show with a gentle premise, browsing the web together. Don't forget to like and subscribe and you can find all of the links to the things that we visit in the show's blog post, which you can find in the links below. You can also support the show and all of my other creative work at comeinternetwith.me slash support. Right, let's find out who's today, who today's guest is. My guest today is Chef Mangalan. Whoops. We could look at his picture. About. So Chef is a design researcher working in the emergent field between future studies and design. His work uses speculative and patisserie methods to explore alternative futures and couple them to strategic objectives with a focus on multi-species perspectives and regenerative ecologies. He's a code conspirator at the ZOOP project, which is a new type of legal entity that offers membership to humans as well as multi-species ecological communities. He's an advisory commission member of the Creative, Creative Industries Fund in the Netherlands and associate, an associate of GRIP Foundation, dedicated to making technical, political, and cultural understanding of our digital society accessible. Chef, would you like to come internet with me? Hey, what's up? Hello. How are you doing? Here we are. Ooh, from a pretty good in the camo forest here in beautiful <laughs> Finland. What have you been up to AFK today? Um, I've been uh, actually out around this area, mountain biking on a local trail. That was my wake up. Let's go do this first before the emailing begins. Very nice. And the Zooming and the, <laughs> uh, the usual routine of nowadays. Yeah. You've been uh, giving a lot of care and attention to your, your bikes recently, I've seen. Um, yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's been my lockdown thing. I ended up moving to Finland, not entirely expectedly. Um, so yeah, I've taken up mountain biking in the last six months. And um, you buy one bike, and then you buy a second bike, and then you figure out what an actual really good bike is like to ride. And now I'm at four. Is it uh, and 0.25, four and a half? <laughs> it's, it's the, uh, I guess this is 3.5. There's three, three that I actually yeah. ride. The bike that always needs to work for errands. My, mm -hmm. my mullet monster uh, drop bars on an old mountain, 90s mountain bike build. And my hardtail stump jumper that actually goes out on the trails. Nice. And a Cannondale that is not entirely functional. <laughs> Yeah, which but, is, uh, yeah, we've been through a couple at this point already. You'll get there. You'll get there. Yeah. Um, what topic have you chosen uh, for today's show? What are we going to search? I'm really excited to okay. find out. So um, I've been working on a proposal that uh, uh, a friend of ours, Tom Carlson, um, pitched to me. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted me to work with him on... Uh, uh, a project where he had one phrase in particular when he was pitching it that just stuck with me is, okay, this is great. And that little phrase is landscape as mind palace. Right. So the larger scope of the project is it's about uh, the way that before humans wrote things down, how did they know stuff? Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking about myths and monsters and uh, using those old narrative strategies to talk in new ways about the landscape. But this phrasing that he used in particular, landscape as mind palace was fascinating to me. So he's thinking about the ways in which humans code knowledge. Um, but yeah, I, so I know that you have, um, what's it? Landscape as platform. Is Land as platform. Yeah, pitch, yep. pitch, boom, boom. Um, but this idea of the landscape as mind palace, um, uh, Conceptually, it really stuck with me, but I also realized like I have a little mind palace about what a mind palace is, but I've actually never looked up what mind palaces are, who mm -hmm. came up with this, what, what they are. So that's, okay. that's, that's where I want to go today. 
I'll make a mind palace for the mind palace in the landscape. <laughs> Shall we should we dive into well the search probably should be landscapers mind palace and see if anyone's yeah. written about let's, it yet. Let's do that. And if yeah. if not, then we'll go mind palace, I'm thinking. Yeah. Oops. Help me find. Let's have a look. Mental landscape, landscape as idea and concept. Let's have a look at that. With landscape in mind, hmm. do you think he'd much future as a landscape photographer? No, landscape as metaphor, that seems good. I mean, in my head, I'm already thinking about some of the stuff that like, um, uh, like the work of Kenneth Olwig as well, and um, and Tim Ingold a little bit, but let's have a look. Proceedings of the second meeting of the workshop of the implementation of European Landscape Conservation Convention, 2003, Landscapers Idea and Concept. Landscape, often with the addition of culture or natural has become the most popular word slogan in the last 10 years. Whoever visits the internet and types in cultural landscape or natural landscape to research into a research engine, will be rewarded oh, less than 2003, a research engine, will be rewarded with, 10, 000, with tens of thousands of sites. Humboldt, the total landscape is totality of all aspects of a region as perceived by man. Any landscape study, hmm. the social and economic situation of Welsh quarrymen. What does it say? Mental landscape. Perception of change and progress. Therefore, important the concepts about the landscape we live in. Manage the landscape when it's changing anyway and permanently as stated above. One answer lies in the speed and track of change we observe in the present. We are in danger to lose all the specific character of different landscapes. Okay. Sure. The importance of bias diversity has been well accepted during the past years, not only because of the good lobbying. Oh yes, look at this. This is very interesting, bearing the lead somewhat. The main tasks for future landscape management, in my opinion, are to better understand the process of forming the present landscape so we can model the future changes and what results and what results can be expected from specific actions. Involve people, civic society into the process, not just at a late stage, but from the beginning, including ideas and concepts, managing the landscape and making them wardens of a landscape. To better evaluate, yeah. Uh, to better evaluate the true value of diversity of landscapes by diversity. Hmm. It's not exactly what we were looking for, but a nice answer. No, this, this is all well and true, but uh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't really, it kind of misses this idea of coding knowledge in the landscape. Yeah. Landscape is metaphor. metaphor. Noel right. Harrison. Kia Kreutler would, would definitely know about this stuff. As I absorbed the fairy landscape of small Dunland's woods, for me, set, the setting of the book functions on several levels. Right. This actually speaks to, to kind of what you're saying, but it's an imaginary landscape. The main character is, a, um, where is it? The brooding bogs the North Meath are a means through which the reader can experience not only the overall haunting atmosphere of the book, but understands the interior world of different characters. For Athena, I guess, the main character, it's the reminder of a grief and a means which she remembers her missing sister. No. No, 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 also not, re not really there, not really there. Okay, so um, I'm wondering if we should just continue to go until we find what we're looking for, like various searches. 
<laughs> rather than um, diving into mind palaces. Yeah, so it, I'm really, this is kind of why I wanted to search it because I'm not sure if anyone has ever used this yeah. particular turn of phrase. Um, I'm, so he was thinking, yeah, go ahead. Because I'm just wondering about... Um, uh, what are they called? Um, trail trees? I posted a long thing about them on Solarpunk, on Solarpunks a while ago. Um, mysterious bent trees are actually Native American trail markers. And if we dive into this, <laughs> there may be something about um, them encoding stories. Many people today do not know how to navigate with the GPS. Some younger generations don't even know how to use a paper map. However, the, in ancient times, before of those things existed in ancient times, like 20 years ago, people need to navigate in the United States, Native Americans came up with a novel solution, shaping nature for their own means into trail markers. So here's an example. Yeah, so that's definitely more what we're looking at. For trail markers, river crossings, or important sites such as Pikes Peak in Colorado, Native Americans would bend young trees into shapes that were not found in nature, such as right out. Once molded, saplings would retain these unusual shapes throughout their lives. There may be different shapes for different tribes. The exact shape and species may vary. According to the Great Lakes Trail Marker Tree Society, let's have a look at that. These trees can be found throughout the United States and Canada. Furthermore, each tribe had their own unique way of molding the trees, helping them hold their positions. According to Alapachan history, some trees were weighted down with rocks or dirt, while others were tied down with rawhide, bark, or vine, depending on the materials and the tree shaper had access to. There is much evidence for many oddly shaped trees having been markers. Trail marker tree conservationists note that not every oddly shaped tree is a trail marker, but explain that there are ways to tell if the unusual shape was an accident. Yeah. Enthusiasts who investigate the trees, whether trees are such as the mountain stewards, distinctive shape. Um, those that are not old enough to be in shape during the native, uh, the time, time the native Americans lived and shaped the trees. Man, the way that people write about indigenous people, like even if they're like doing a doing an article like this, it's like the, the time that Native Americans lived, it's like they're still alive. They're still alive. Still. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. The uh, I think there's this, there's also some stuff around the way that uh, the Aboriginal people in Australia worked with the landscape. Yeah, I, they I have mean, similar ways of. There's the song lines around this. that they have as well. Yeah. Um, let's just have a look at this, because I do seem to remember when I was looking before, there was a, um, that they have a, a book with full of illustrations. Trail marker trees were an ancient form of land and water navigational aids, as well as making system to denote areas of significant importance, such as ceremonial sites. These trees were used by many, if not all of the Native American tribes and later fur traders and early pioneers. Researcher Dennis Downs was the first, was first introduced to the trail marker trees as a young boy and was influenced by his own Native American relative being influenced and followed by the footsteps of Dr. Raymond Jansen. Yes, I think that's the guy who wrote the book. Yeah, this is it. Native American trail markers marking paths through the wilderness. I've always wanted to get a copy of it. I was um, going to say, do you have it or what? No, I list. think I remember trying to buy it and thinking that it was quite expensive. But it is now, uh, now available, available as an ebook. Ah, uh, you see? You always have to like follow this stuff up. <laughs> uh, now I'm wondering if if I shut is it story? Uh, 
tells a story about the involvement of numerous individuals. Let me just move this. I'm just going to have a look to see if there's stories. Story of the market trees to life. That's history stuff. Yeah. Let's have a quick look at this stuff. This is videos, photos. So there's a bronze trail marker thing there. That's cool. It's not what we're looking for though. Poems. The trail marker tree. The hands were laid, the stakes secured to hold the sapling tree. Then Father Time applied his will to process for a term, to bind in cause and stay in form and change in height and girth, this wonder work of nature. Set to a point the way on earth, a pathway's guide, a journey's aid, a symbol poised to show the way to destinations in the dark and in the snow. A language known to some and yet to others a mystery, the friends of natives and to downs, the trail marker tree. Well, that's cool. Donald has bars. All <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, um, let's have a quick look through this thing. And if they have any stories, if not, we can go back to stories, story, 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 yeah, story. story. yeah. Um, okay, strange things. Um, what should we do next? I think we should have a look at mind palaces. Yeah. Mind palaces. Um, it's like Bruno, wasn't it? Who came up with it originally or named it as that? Yeah, was it? The mind, mind palace. palace. Unusually, the, um, Wikipedia wasn't the first search for <laughs> the first hit for a couple yeah. internet with me. So method of loci is a strategy of me memory enhancement, which uses visualizations of familiar spatial environments in order to enhance the recall of information. Metal of loci is known as the memory journey, memory palace or mind palace technique. This method is a mnemonic device adopted in ancient Roman and Greek rhetorical treatises. This term is found in psychology, neurobiology, and memory. Contemporary usage. Many effective memorizers today use the method of loci to some degree. Contemporary me memory competition, in particular the World Memory Championships. Okay. The rhetorica ad herenium. Okay. It formally attributed to Cicero. You see, this is more about rhetoric rather than other sources recommend uh, method of. What's the elaborative encoding there? However, due to the strength of spatial memory, simply mentally placing objects in real or imagined locations without further elaboration huh. can be effective for simple associations. Variation of method of loci. My psychologist friends at uni were like really into memory palaces and stuff. And that's like always been on the edges of. So, I mean, at, at a certain point, this had to be used to encode like pretty much everything people knew, right? About survival in their local environment. What yeah. you can and can't eat, what'll kill you, what won't, where to go, when. Mm -hmm. It's all going to be kept somehow, somewhere. So I mean, yeah. my laptop is literally uh, sitting on a book called Flowers and Their Histories right now, which is like all sorts of small snippets of fairy tales and um, and stories about the flowers and where they come from and what they, they're good for, based on very similar um, proposition that you just had. Hmm. The method of loci a mnemonic device that relates spatial relationships between loci. System link. 
Hmm. So this is like being completely codified as to how to do it. Oh. Interesting. But I think if you're going to be working on a project like these particular terms, method of loci, the system link, peg word method, or person action object might be really useful. And it'll be interesting to uh, just take these things out into the landscape and uh, see how, like, try to build a grocery list either in the forest or for the forest. I'm not sure. Maybe we should try both. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I really want to, um, did you, are you familiar with Sarah Perry's work? We're doing a bit of a bouncing no. around now. Um, yeah. But uh, Sarah Perry, Perry, uh, I want to say it's navigation, ribbon farm. The essence of peopling. Oh, she's ribbon farm. Okay. Yeah. Pseudo ethnography of egregores, weaponized sacredness. I don't think it's in that essay. I think it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for maps. I'm just going to go to images <laughs> and see if, because like, yeah, there's a map that she drew. Um, that will, is, you know, like we'll, we'll sp spring my memory. Oh boy, uh, now we're getting into map lands. <laughs> this is Fox, Crypto, Russia. <laughs> Oh dear. She wrote this amazing piece. Come on, come on, come on. Sarah Perry. Let's have a look. I should have just done this originally. Uh, not meaning something runs through the whole world, treasure hunting, light in the American whale, social media consciousness. That essay is great. December. Mm, they're in newest to oldest. What is that? Folk concepts, rectangle vision. It might be that one. How magical thinking made us modern. Yeah. I have to take the tenderers of our brains of egregores. I might have to abandon this and just say that she wrote this amazing piece on maps and um, how and like systems of the world. Um, well, for those who are watching, the world as if is this is about how how, how magical thinking made us modern. Um, talks about the seven laws of magical thinking by Matthew Hudson, which is a great book. Um, as moderns, we are thrown into a confusing mess as we come to terms with the world through the lens of literacy, especially through the hyper literacy of the internet mediated reality. Um, reveals the complexity of the as if modes of thinking. When we say we must live as if we were free, arguably paraphrasing Kant, or one treats the dead as if still alive, Sinzi. Um, which is kind of the basic, the, the formation of magical thinking. But we'll leave that there and have a look if this is the systems of the world. No, I'm, I'm afraid oh, I can't oh find no. it. <laughs> Oh, well, I mean, it this ends. is where we should just follow the links rather than try and find out <laughs> stuff. Just um, start a new tangents. Yeah, exactly. Should, should we get back to how to build this mind palace? Did we do an image search on mind palace? What do people yeah, that's a good idea. that looks like? That would be quite instructive, actually. Deep dream is how I imagine it. Oh, yeah, because that's how it's on... It's on... Um, whatever that show is. So it's like cyberspace, but it's black and white. Yeah, I mean, that. no, that's how it's shown in Sherlock Holmes. Oh, okay, right. 
because he has one. Oh, Sherlock, Mind Palace. I see. There's a lot of the same guy showing up everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah gotcha. Um, that's cool. Let's find out what that is. <laughs> Og wheels will explode out of your head. That's oh no, a house will grow out of your head. I think that's yeah. It's it's, it's weird that they uh, they depict it, the Mind Palace as the exterior observed growing outside of your head like yeah wouldn't you be in the mind palace i not... think in the i mean honestly i've seen like one episode of sherlock holmes or whatever it's called sherlock and i think mm -hmm. he like like arrives in it and then he like walks around it and finds the solution yeah. and then like jolts back i don't know i mean that's how i if it's i was the, 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 yeah my imagination of it like when you say mind palace the picture i had in my head is like that you see um like more like a huge library kind of situation. Yeah, there was a picture. Yeah, the, like... the Castlevania underground library type yeah. thing where you have to go through weird mirrors yeah. and ladders and stuff to get to all your things. Not there's a palace on my head or like a funny hat. <laughs> where is this for our oh, like, So that's from that's from Tumblr. That's BBC Sherlock yeah. propaganda. And unfortunately, Ecosia <laughs> has done something. There we go. Visit website. Oh um, no, what's that Disney one? Oh yeah. What was that other one? Here we go. Let's visit the website for this as well. Visit website. Oh yeah, what's that? How to build your mind palace with the library illustration. Bulletproof blogger. Is this the guy that has the bulletproof coffee? No, it'd be all like be branded. Surely not. Welcome to the mind building your organization when organizing your mind palace. So how does one go about creating a comprehensive swipe file? You re quickly retrieve just the right piece of information at the right time without drowning in a sea of data. I mean, I think, I mean, organizing your memories is a really good idea. Oh, this is Evernote. Nope, nope, nope. That's external <laughs> brain. That's fine. Yeah. Storage, readability. Uh, so we're also moving into like people building in a similar way to that stuff that I found with um, TX Watson, actually, like Zettelkasten method, external second brain stuff. Yeah. Um, and I'm also thinking about what's the, like the, what's it called again? The, the like early cybernetic, the desk with all the knowledge in it, where it was still yeah. mechanical. Um, yeah. You know what I mean, but I forgot I what it's called. <laughs> the, the, not the one, it, uh, what's it, what is it called? Oh, it doesn't really matter. Um, I could search desk with all the knowledge in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, whoops, that's not how you, mouse, how you spell Mind Palace. Because you will figure it out. So yeah, this is oh, the one that I'm most familiar with, is Giano, Giano, Giordano Bruno's memory system. I just automatically assumed you were referring to Bruno Latour and was just like, oh, it's just one of those things I never bothered reading. Oh, no. <laughs> I, 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 it w I wouldn't surprise me if Bruno Latour could like w wax lyrical on his own. That's a, exactly like I'm, I'm sure if you, yeah. Yeah, I meant Giordano Bruno. <laughs> Here is a fascinating page, web page. Thank you, other blog posts. Oh, we're going to webarchive.org. Proper internet. That's, yeah, yeah. Now we're getting into it interact with this app with a crypto wallet i haven't earned enough um bat tokens to set up a a a, a, a to like a, a wallet yet from all the shows that i've done francis yates and the mnemonic works of giordano bruno after Warburg's death in 18 uh, and sorry 1929 the migration of the institute to london brunian studies at the Warburg institute to a very different direction Thanks to the research of Francis Yates. I was talking about her with Kia as well. Second time she's come up recently, or in this episode. Um, the Art of Memory. Now that the memory book is at last ended, the memory of the late uh, Gertrude Bing seems more poignant present. Yates expanded the first results of her research on Bruno's Art of Memory. Flash is required. Oh, it's not showing the image. Wow. Yeah. So he has his own system. To approach the larger wheel, Bruno advises the reader, it is necessary to dilute the printed page into an immense space. Dilute into an immense space. I like that. Make it, yeah. 
The last section of De Umbris Idiom describes the content of a larger wheel over 40 pages. It consists of five concentric rings divided in 150 rays. Wayback Machine is loading. I just want to quickly have a look at, um, I, I, she should hopefully, um, hopefully she's going to come on the show, but I'm just going to have a quick look at her writing and see if she's published anything. Aha. Oh. Francis Yates, <laughs> in European politicians claim the novel coronavirus poses the greatest challenge to its nations. Here we go. I spent one of my more anxious mornings in early March reading about a niche yet controversial disagreement in 1584 about memory. Term memory often places refers to a teak of memorization. When you memorize a long poem, you could recount it imagely by walking through a long hallway, remembering from your childhood. In each hall of the doorway, you place an object that you will help you remember the next verse in the poem. Cicero popularized the memory palace in the Oratore, which he recounts the poet Simu's grace to escape a collapsed building. It becomes a popular amongst oratory education in Rome and subsequent tr traditions. I guess if like you've got to be able to remember stuff if there isn't that much access to wax slates and stuff like that. Yeah. In 1584, the English advocate of Ramanism, Ramism denounced Giordano Bruno's text on memory palaces that emphasized the aestheticized, associational and imaginal realm. Bruno, a friar, philosopher, a mathematician, poet, cosmological theorist and occultist would be burned at the stake over a decade later in 1600. In his surviving text on memory palaces is described by the academic Yates. He emphasizes, Images in memory palaces must be charged with effects and particularly with the effect of love for they have the power to penetrate to the core of both the inner and outer worlds. An extraordinary mingling here of classical memory advice um, on using emotionally charged images combined with a magician's use of emotionally charged imagination, which have the power to open up the black diamond doors within the psyche. Eroticism running through Bruno's art of memory was unfavorable to puritanical English regimes um, on the shadows of ideas is Bruno's earliest work devoted to the art of memory he lists 30 sets of descriptive images which include images of the zodiac planets lunar mansions and horoscopes each set of these images is meant to be placed within the corresponding segment of a circle divided by 30 spokes to form a wheel okay Bruno's many descriptions of astral, astral mem memory palaces however were not purely his creation Evidence of a much larger tradition we today encapsulate in the term of hermeticism. Yes. The technique of inhabiting astral memory palaces archit architected an imaginal co cosmos as a tool for self-transformation, which might even be referred to today as self-improvement, to reorient the individual towards the planetary. Yeah, I agree, Key. Cosmology in hermetic sense, however, was not a static knowledge artifact, but conceived of fundamentally alive. Therefore, the construction of an inner cosmos was not unidirectional, but cybernetically took place in dialogue with a living world. Perhaps in Afrophenia, it sought a kind of mutual autopoesis. Eye movement therapy and somatic releasing. Within the zeitgeist of the planetary scale, I've been stuck recently by the deep inadequacy of the corners of contemporary media philosophy I'm equated with it with to offer us a useful lens on the present. You would think cultural discipline based on design critique would be the first insightful forefront when the, divi the digital divide becomes stark and parts of civilization's lives becomes online fully on air. Zoning based on extra planetary resources, spectrum and transhumanist exit. Zoning based on supply chain accessibility and city to city transport inner resilient space network practices and system and belief systems. I think the key task in the coming years is to struggle to redraw ma many maps on horizontal, vertical, and inner places. And this means for us here reading this to in institutionally interrogate where boundaries of accepted knowledge are allowed to resettle. That narrative externalities like star stories and in inhuman artifacts as tools for resilient memory practices priced into our approach towards resilient ecosystems will end up with the same poverty of thought that can't see the trees unless the forest has been cut down. <laughs> 
It's right to turn towards science fiction in an extraplanetary future it is equally correct to examine planetary agency in all aesthetic practices, not as a as return to simple causal narratives, nor as an ontological salve, but to move towards interrogation of richer inner realm and possible of pre-existing. Pre-existing, yeah. Um, UK Labour Party. Wuhan. The song lines was an interesting bit. Yeah, if you haven't read uh, the the book Song Lines, I definitely recommend reading that. It's one of those, you know, it's it's in a text file somewhere with a bunch of bullet points, of <laughs> things that I did not get around to reading yet. Um, Song Lions audiobook, hey. Yeah, I don't Bruce actually Chatwin. use audiobooks. Can you not listen to them while you're... I can't. I need the language part of my brain to do other things almost all the time. As, yeah. And if someone's talking at me, then I, yeah, I'm just paralyzed. Then I have to listen to them. So I think this is the book, definitely like the book for you as part of your research. Um, the Song Lines is a 1987 book written by Bruce Chatwin, combining fiction and nonfiction. Chatwin describes a trip to Australia where he is taken for the express purpose of researching Aboriginal song and its connections to nomadic travel. Discussions with Australians, many of them Indigenous Australians, yield insights into outback culture, Aboriginal culture and religion and the Aboriginal land rights movement. Chatwin develops a sequ uh, his thesis about the primordial nature of the Aborig of Aboriginal song and writing, and writing engages the hard conditions of life. Chatwin asserts that language started as song and that the Aboriginal dream time, it sang the land into existence for the conscious mind and memory. As you sing the land, the tree, the rock, the path, they come to be and the singers are one with them. Chatwin combines evidence for Aboriginal culture and modern ideas on human evolution and argues that African savanna were, were a migratory species hunted by the dominant feline predator. A wandering spread song lines across the globe, generally from Southwest to Northeast eventually reaching Australia, where they are now preserved in the world's oldest living culture. Um, it's also, I wonder if, oh, this is it. Sea song line for the actual mythology. Dreamy track. A song line is called a dreaming track, one of the paths across the land the animist belief system of Aboriginal Australians, which mark the route followed by a localized creator beings during the dreaming. The path of the song lines are recorded in traditional song cycles, stories, dance, and art. They're a vital part of Aboriginal culture. Whoops. Uh, connecting people to their land. A song line has been called a dreaming track as it marks a route across the land or sky followed by one of the creator beings or ancestors in the dreaming. Um, I'm also just thinking about, there's a book that I read a couple of years ago. I can't remember, I can't see it from here. It's the book about the navigator, how Polynesians navigated um, and how they encoded all of the, all of their stories in the stars and how it would be like, you have to wait for a week after the, after a particular part of the story of the stars because that was when the mm -hmm. like the winds changed direction yeah um what book is that called polynesian i'm sure i'm also interested in their uh creator beings that originate these myths oh there's a bunch of them yeah there is a bunch of them and I don't know which one it was that I read, <laughs> but yeah, put a pin in that. You should definitely check that out. Yeah. Uh, where did you see the creator beings? This, this, uh, a song line has been called a dreaming track as it marks a route across the land or sky followed by one of the creator beings or ancestors, ancestors. in the dreaming. Yeah. So, um, so everybody has, about them. everybody has their own dreaming track. So someone might, be even if you're in the same family you have different you might be the kangaroo or you might be um 
a certain type of snake or whatever and and you learn and so that and they're the and everyone who's in those traditions learns part of those songs and then um here we go oral history about places and journeys are carried in song lines and each aboriginal person has the obligations to their birthplace the song becomes the basis of ceremonies which are enacted in those specific places along the song lines by singing the songs in the appropriate sequence, Aboriginal people could navigate vast uh, distances, often traveling through the deserts of Australia's interior. The continent of Australia contains an extensive system of song lines, some of which are a few kilometers, while others transverse hundreds of kilometers through many different Aboriginal peoples. I think there is actually a map of Australian song lines we can look for. Yeah, let's have a look. Maybe not. Or maybe there is one, but I just don't remember where I've seen it. <laughs> or maybe these all are, you know. The... Yeah. Well, yeah, quite. Um, common ground is a. Song lines have been a prominent feature of Aboriginal cultures for over 60,000 years. Song lines explain the laws by which the desert people have lived and their origin in the country. Through an elder in, H in Central Australia, these song lines are part of life. Now, second nature, whereas outsiders explaining the significance of song lines remains incredibly difficult. Now, Peterson, in his courtly essay, A Rightful Place, compares the song lines of the Central Australia to the Odyssey, the Iliad, and the Book of Genesis, referring to these song lines as Australia's very own Book of Gen Genesis. Became popularized by Bruce Chatwin. There was controversy over this name as it implied the Aboriginal people would sing their way across the country like an ancient GPS or computer map. While song lines do in fact chart the landscape of Australia, there is no navigational radar interwoven into these songs. They tell the real story of this continent that you've got to have both histories. They are held in different ways, told in different ways. They're essentially complementary. So I've been thinking a lot about, um, uh, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. I've been thinking a lot about lo um, local folklore mm -hmm. and, um, and stuff like that around kind of memory in, in terms, not necessarily as a, a memory palace, but especially around um dwelling inside a landscape and and encouraging that kind of um that reciprocal feeling that you need to have to have a connection in place yeah and um local folklore and knowing the local folklore of your area even if you're in a city right like each borough must have stories or things that happen that could be narrativized in that sense but one of the things that I've, the word that i've been using to think about it is story dwelling instead of storytelling mm -hmm. um, in that you are in landscape in place and that there are stories that perpetually unfold around you in this place is devil's well or this place is you know some other some other term and those stories are actually always unfolding because it's always going to be devil's well <laughs> yeah. in, in that sense um yeah i mean I, i'm not entirely sure how how to like um get any further than that in my description of what i mean by story dwelling but like i think it's a no, useful but term I, I i think i can kind of grip it because this is what we kind of want to do and this landscape where this project is going to be is over time go through a kind of iterative design process that we have loosely structured but where we're working with locals and domain experts to investigate uh, using the the tools of uh, myth to create kind of uh, monsters out of the local landscape elements like there's a military fort there there's a natural area there there's a highway that runs through it the controversy over which basically started environmentalism in the netherlands right there's um 
expansions of the city, urban areas that have moved into it. So we want to, because this, uh, like the old local folklore in a lot of places in the Netherlands, it's kind of, it's, they're just gone. Like people don't have a real connection to the landscape. And then what they are connected to is this very manufactured Dutch landscape where for a lot of people, if it's green, it's nature. They don't see yep. a cornfield as a desert or anything in this way. So yeah, we're, we're going to be investigating various methods through this process by which people uh, look at the landscape. And in the end, we hope to come to um, a kind of a workshop that will be part of an exhibition where people create their own myths and monsters with the characters embodied by this landscape and use that as a way to talk about the future of the area. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I will, uh, we'll be going back and looking through a bunch of these uh, mind palace creation methods. I'm wondering so about like, um, maybe we should look for telling stories in landscape. Mm. Stories with landscape maybe. Story. Landscape magazine. <laughs> Storytelling in landscape. Story. Here we go. This looks interesting. Open forests. Storytelling guide for the landscape. Open Very forest. Is too many projects called open forest. Yeah. Mm. Successful landscape communities do not tell stories about their projects. They tell stories through their projects. I don't know about that. Oh, I have this PDF somewhere. Fair enough. I got my free tours. Yeah. <laughs> Explorer.land. Let's go back. Um, telling stories with landscape design, storytelling in landscape photography, how to tell a story in your landscape mm. photos. I'm going to put folklore. Storytelling and cultural traditions, telling tales, supernatural stories. Mm. Scrolls and stories. Folklore surrounding British trees. That looks cool. Let's have a look. Oh, it just tells you what they are good for. Healing properties. <laughs> Spoonful of ash sap and sick children would pass through the cleft of a tree or a sapling in the hope that it might cure them. Hazel, knowledge and wisdom. The bane of my existence is leaf blowers. Ah, uh, yep. I hate them. We also, we have a very active housing association here. Um, so the lawn is very mowed outside. And yeah. yeah. All yeah, that seems a great shame. Um, I'm wondering. Because huh. this is kind of like the opposite, but I wonder if there's any um, learnings from building memory palaces in virtual landscapes. that might be useful for, uh, you know, in terms of the process. Monks VR, <laughs> memory paralysis and virtual reality. Software for building memory VR, learn huge amounts of time, full retention. Man, this website is- Do they have any videos? This is going to be like extremely lawnmower manny moving vases around. Yeah. There. All right. So I'm not sure. Oh. Oh, oh yeah. I'm seeing some. Very now, nice are, how elements. many kids out there do you think there are who have accidentally built VR memory palaces in Roboblox or Minecraft? Immensely more than there are people claiming to write things about it that are, you know, you know, smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Virtual memory palaces combining an ancient memory technique with modern VR. 
Mm -hmm. There's Cicero again. Yep. In a University of Probably. Maryland study, testing was done in pre-constructed medieval town and palace environments purchased through TurboSquid. All right, so they bought all of the assets online. Mm -hmm. 42 pictures yep. of the faces of famous people. There and here comes access. that good lawnmower many ship. <laughs> then in the retail phase, pictures of the faces were swapped out with numbers <laughs> and participants were asked to give the name and level of confidence to their record. <laughs> yeah, well, that's an interesting study. Doesn't really help us. Yeah, I mean, you might as well just use Minecraft. Um, well, what else can we have a look at? Landscapes is Mind Palace. We didn't do an image search on this landscape as mind palace. What does it, what does the algorithm think <laughs> we should be looking at? Landscapes. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, What's this? Sherlock. There's a, there's a... More Sherlock stuff. Got some anime city stuff. Pinterest. Curse you, Pinterest. Yeah, it's a uh, hype interest. It just infects. It's, yeah. There was, if you go a little bit back further up, there was a kind of abstract art-ish thingy somewhere there. You uh, let me know. Back up, back up, back up. Yeah, it's in the top left now. This one. That, that, yeah. Pinterest. God. Yeah, we'll see if it has the backlink or not. The... The website source. Or it has a giant popover asking you to Pinterest. No, hey. Nope. We're trapped in Pinterest. That? From Surreal ah. Mac. There we go. Do you reckon Pinterest, Pint but Pinterest is like the fourth biggest social network in the world or something like that, isn't it? Is it? They got that big off of wedding planning and mood boards. Yeah. That's a great piece of art, actually. I like it. This piece takes through eternal twilight, the palace where wakefulness and sleep come together. The events of a day fade away. And the most gentle fragments are organized on a shelf, displayed to serve a pleasant memories of the years to come. I've actually, I remember reading about, like in that liminal state between being awake and asleep is that you should actually organize your day like that and put stuff on. Hmm. Stuff that happened into boxes and on shelves. Peace comes. This pie palace is neither still nor chaotic with its walls and corridors. Well, there you go. Surreal dreams and nocturne scenescapes, sure. I'm just going to have a look at the rest of this art. Art with a story. I'd be interested to see art without a story. How could you? <laughs> Triptych. 800 bucks. Yep. Crystal ship in spades. Wow. If you go to cominternetwith.me slash support and donate, then um, I might consider buying one of these. <laughs> wow, that's cool. Which, uh, where where does it go? Looks like Deep Dream. Oh, I'll <laughs> just put it right there. <laughs> oh, so you can look at it. That's it. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like Deep Dream. At this point, I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is that is very true. I'm afraid that uh, it's been a good search so far, but I mean, it's a little sad that we haven't, that we didn't actually find. I bet there is a whole like um, field of research around this that just like needs the academic name to unlock. Yeah, there must be. I've been purposefully restraining myself from searching this. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. Oh, they found interesting stuff. 
there i mean i'm just gonna no i'm not gonna do that there is a, if you have a look at the um at kenneth olwig's work um he definitely mm -hmm. writes about similar stuff to this um he just uh kenneth olwig let me find the name of the book i might as well share my screen again since we are interneting together Kenneth Orwig. I wonder if it's on his Wikipedia page. Yes, this one. This is the one that I, I read last year. The Meanings of Landscape, Essays on Place, Space, Nature, and Justice. Extremely good and worthwhile to, to check I'm out. I'm definitely also going to dig into the Nordic landscapes, seeing as those are the ones that I spend my time mountain biking in now. Yeah, so he uh, is from Olwig. I've got a old... Um, uh, permanently moved podcast where I talk about this, but um, uh, Olwig is the person who's writing introduced me to the idea of landship. In the same way as you're in friendship, you could be in landship with some with a landscape. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, because of I was thinking about it in terms of land as platform, in in terms of like the same as story dwelling. Actually, story dwelling is like another. Uh, it's 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 another, um, because we're talking about human stories or the, the stories that we're in, but you'll still have a relationship with the landscape in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's an old permanently move to talk about landship. That's from about that's two interesting ago. that the, uh, in Dutch, the words uh, uh, friendship and landscape are friendship and landschap. So they actually yeah. use the yeah, in his essay, I think it's, it's I think it comes from Landscalp or something like that in one of the yeah. Nordic languages. Yeah, which mm -hmm. means the same thing. And that that'll um, be from Swedish. It's roughly uh, and yeah. and people from um, who move away from their villages will always say that they're in landship with their hometown or their where they're from. Yeah, no, I feel that. Yeah, it's uh, I think pretty much the. It wasn't homesickness, but what I experienced having moved out of New Zealand to the Netherlands when I was 12 years old, and then in my young 20s being like, I should probably go back. I'm not mm -hmm. sure why, but yeah, and then you go back and you're like, oh yeah, okay, now I know why. It's, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And that, it's because this is where time, I'm from, actually, yeah. And I wonder how that, sounds, how that like interacts with uh, ancient Greeks or, and, and, Medi and the kind of European medieval period that thought that um, nostalgia was a disease that you could catch from other people <laughs> yeah well i guess back then like also if you if you moved away it was a lot more permanent you yeah. weren't jumping on easy jet to pop back home for like if if you were a traveler and you'd left you were yeah pretty gone. gone for a while yeah yeah, for yeah. Sure. yeah it sounds like a really cool project that you're working on it's uh yeah well we, we'll we'll see if it gets funded it'll happen in some <laughs> form regardless but you know how these things go it's uh right now it's a bunch of ideas in google docs and uh maybe sometime soon we'll actually be able to announce it awesome well we're we're coming up on an hour um what else are you working on or that you would like to tell people watching about um, so I'm working on a bunch of uh well a series of workshops that by the time this what do these things do? Do they air? Do they get broadcasted? By the time this is like other people Posted. are watching it, that'll all be over. But they're part of um, the the bigger Zoop project, which you mentioned is in my bio, was in the introduction, um, which is a much longer term, a multi-year uh, research and execution project that I'm doing um, with a lot of people and the the. The core person in it is Klaus Gautenbrauer at the New Institute, who you also know. But so, yeah, what we're doing is we're looking at a, a, a new legal form of incorporation that um, incorporates humans with non-humans um, in a way that uh, supports um, regenerative ecologies and um, wants to get a better representation for non-humans and the human systems in which they have to kind of operate. So that's called the ZOOP, and you can go to the website of the new institute uh, to find out more about I'll the thing. Because Link in the show notes. Yep. 
Um, and uh, yeah, more stuff will just be happening with that throughout the coming years, as we're currently working with a law firm who have actually started to um, legally code up the way that this thing works. And I think that'll be that's exciting uh, coming online soon. Yeah, yeah. we had a, actually had a big win with a huge firm taking this on as a pro bono. Um, so there's actually like a lawyer force behind it. Now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> lawyer vibes. Um, yeah, but within that project, I'll um, always kind of be the person who was doing more speculative design research where we're kind of probing the edges of possible futures for this to uh, figure out where we want to go with it, basically, and uh, mm -hmm. what we can do and what people's uh, conceptions and attitudes are towards where we could take this uh, and where they see themselves positioned in it and how they relate to it. Yeah. Um, so I'll just be keeping on with that. And in various forms here and there, it'll pop up. And where possible, we'll be doing it uh, as field work because it's kind of important to be like situated in these landscapes and things mm. that you're working with. But you know, now in the, in, in the plague times, that's become trickier. So yep. uh, yeah, we'll unless you're happens. a solo in a tent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in the woods. A, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming into that with me. And um, hey, thanks for having me along with the yeah, internet. Yeah, it's been fun. Wicked. Well, I will um, speak to you soon. Yeah, man. Bye.